Good evening. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Jamila Lemieux and I am so excited to moderate what I think is going to be a really wonderful conversation um, about hood feminism, notes from the women that a movement forgot. Uh, this is, of course, a Revolutionary Reads Book Club conversation sponsored by Femit Forward. I'm going to introduce our wonderful panel that just started to uh, assemble before us. So we have um, Sid, musician, um, one of my favorite musicians, somebody who I'm super excited to be sharing space with today, a very big fan. We also have actress, uh, activist, and I want to make sure I don't put this in the wrong order, aspiring director. So not aspiring activist, but that you are a currently an actress and an activist and uh, a director to be. We're also joined by actress Storm Reed. We have the fabulous uh, singer Kiana Lee joining us. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you panelists. Let's dive into this conversation about Mickey Kendall's hood feminism. Uh, the book starts off with Mickey talking about her grandmother being, you know, essentially the first feminist that she knew and somebody who had such a pro-woman approach to how she lived her life, um, who had a lot of power and autonomy and self-possession, right, in terms of the decisions that she made on behalf of her family. But she would not have identified with the term feminist because it's one that was largely associated with privileged white women, right? People who didn't think about the concerns of Black women at all, let alone those of us that are in what we would call the hood. Um, women who have talked about gender equality from a perspective of having the privilege of whiteness and access via their partners, via their fathers and sons to a lot of the spoils of patriarchy, right, and, and of white supremacist patriarchy, um, but still believe themselves to be fighters for, uh, for gender, for feminism, because they Say that they are, but they're not looking at all the women who don't live lives like their own, right? I'm curious to know what you all's initial um, impressions of feminism were when you were younger. Uh, is it an is it a concept that was in, introduced to you in a positive way? Were your parents feminists? Were there people in your community who identify as feminists? Was it something that you discovered a bit later? Um, not that you, any of us are late in our lives yet, but something that came to you once most of your ideas and thoughts were pretty fully formed or um, something else. And I will start with you, Sid, and then Logan, and then Storm. Uh, I, I remember being, from what I can remember, uh, being introduced to feminism in a positive light um, initially. And then after that is when you start to see the... Uh, you know, just the controversy, or 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 better yet, the uh, <laughs> the head the head cock about it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's and, a good way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, yeah. But initially, you know, I, I'm a I'm a I'm a woman. I'm growing up as a female. You know, you always wanna want to you know, follow whatever is for the betterment of other females, so. Would you say you identify as a feminist, Ted? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, as I, I think everyone has a their own version of uh, their own definition of feminism. Um, same way everybody has their own definition of spirituality and uh, I think for me, it's just about making the uh, playing field level. Absolutely. Uh, what about you, Logan? What are some of your earliest, uh, what was your earliest introduction to feminism? What I start to think about is my early, my earliest introduction into femininity in general, kind of like uh, what Mickey does in her book. Um, you know, what, what were the gender politics uh, fed into her? that were fed into her. And um, so I, I just think about my mom, my aunts, my my grandmother, the, the, the matriarchs in my family, I feel like they were always around. I felt very blessed in that way. Um, and so because of that, I feel like, um, I feel like my personal uh, relationship with feminism is something that I would say is relatively 
new, and I say new in like the past decade. I'm, I'm in my, I'm 31. So I'd say in the past decade, my relationship with feminism has been in development so much so that I'm grateful because I think it is so, uh, it's so um, new that it has the ability to be shifted into what I think is the most inclusive version, like womanism, like just being able to make sure that my my own concepts are are not limited, and which is I think the uh, the big kind of um, address this addressing that this book is made. Uh, but yeah, I just feel like my personal relationship is what with with femininity was with my my parents, my my mom, my my aunt, my and the way that they um, the way that they led with their blackness as women. I mean, like it it, it wasn't it, you cannot separate it as a black woman. You don't get to to separate that. So I think that I didn't have an early relationship with feminism because I did always understand that you will lead with your blackness. That's, um, you raise a really good point, Logan, and that's really at the core of this book in so many ways, right? That like for black women living at this intersection of blackness and womanhood, we're so often taught that what leads first is our blackness, right? So that no matter what, we're still black. Uh, and I think that Mickey really makes the case in this book that you can't separate the two, right? You can't, the, these two experiences are unique. So we don't have the same experiences as black men, uh, we don't have the same experiences as black boys, as black, you know, when we're black girls. And um, we also don't have the same needs and concerns and, and the same, I guess, connection to our community or same expectation that the community is going to protect black women or, or that, you know, I, I think of the endangered species talk about black men in the 90s, right? That black men are an endangered species in 2000s and that, you know, we have to take care of them all. But that's not messaging that most of us grew up hearing about black women and girls, right? That the, the black women and girls are in crisis and that we have to take care of them all. You know, we as a people, we as black folks that we're responsible for our girls, right? Storm, um, with you being the youngest member of this conversation, I'm so curious to hear one, of course, what your early memories of femi you know, being introduced to feminism were, but two, as someone who is, you know, not too far outside of girlhood herself, have you felt that your experiences and, and your feelings and, and your challenges um, as a black girl are acknowledged in the same way that you may hear public conversation about black men and boys and some of the things that they're up against. Despite all the talk of black girl magic, um, do you feel like we talk about the not so pretty shiny side of black girlhood uh, publicly enough? Right, yeah, I mean, I would say I'm still trying to figure out feminism and what femininity is uh, as just a 17 year old. I feel like the introduction to feminism was maybe just only a couple years ago and I'm comfortable with saying that but when I look back on it like I have my mom my grandmothers my aunts these these powerful strong women who showcased or or, or taught me what it it is to like Logan said to be black uh, to be a black woman and that intersects with feminism and and to speak up for yourself and 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 be confident and be strong and and don't take no for an answer I feel like those were values that were ingrained in me before I mean I I really figured out who I was or who I'm who I'm figuring out myself to be now um but then when we we have conversations about the experiences of young black girls and, and, and young black men or, or black women and black men in general, um, I feel like those conversations intersect, but also are very different. I feel like um, black women and black girls are very, we're, we're all un, unprotected um, and we're all dehumanized for existing, but I feel like there's just another layer of that where it's not really talked about in mainstream conversations when it comes to black girls and, and, and black women not being or not feeling that protection that we deserve or the, the, the protection or the the fight that we outwardly put out towards other people, whether that be black men or not, or like just all people trying to just speak out and say, this is wrong. This was what needs to be done. Us getting on the front lines and organizing and trying to make a change. I don't feel as though at times that that is reciprocated, if that makes sense. 
And I think that what, um, or what that speaks to, that feeling that, you know, some of you all have experienced, that I've experienced, that Nikki talks about in this book of, of not being included in that, you know, what Black folks are going through struggle, right? Like if we're talking about police violence, how um, Breonna Taylor really being only the second Black woman whose name has been known internationally for being uh, killed by police or, or dying in police custody, right? And before her, there was Sandra Bland, but there've been a lot of Black women and girls killed by police, right? It's not that it isn't happening to us. Uh, it's not happening at the same rate that it's happening to our men and boys, but the way it's talked about, you would think that it's on, that police violence is something that only impacts Black men. What Mickey does is that she puts, uh, I think, responsibility for the lack of connection that Black women feel to feminism, um, largely in the hands of white feminists, right? Because, you know, at home, we're trained, okay, we have to focus on race, right? And that's the messaging that we're largely getting from our, our men and our brothers and our pastors and our fathers, right? Like that, you know, we, we have to think about race, we have to think about uh, what our men need, not just ourselves. And white women, when they say, well, we have to talk about gender, we have to talk about equality, we have to talk about feminism, oftentimes they're not talking about what our needs look like in that space. And because they've ignored Black women and girls who have been victims of sexual violence, because there are times where Black women and girls have been victimized by uh, folks from their communities, from their households and their families, right? And we haven't been able to count on them for protection and solidarity um, because they have not said funding Head Start or making sure that we have uh, benefits for low-income families to purchase food is a feminist priority in the same way that say women moving up in the C-suite, right? And having these, you know, boss chick careers is. So that's not speaking to the experiences of, of black women uh, in the way that it needs to. So she lays out some things that white, you know, feminist uh, and mainstream feminist organizations and institutions can do to bring black women to the party. So one of the big uh, themes of this book is Mickey's charge to main mainstream feminist organizations, individuals who are aligned with, you know, quote unquote, white feminism and saying, look, if feminism is going to be what frees women, right? And, and gender non-conforming people and people across the globe, it can't just be about the needs of white middle-class women, right? So we're saying, Black women, you've profited from Black women's work. Your feminism is better because of the thought leadership of Black women. You have to now cater to us, right? You have to be inclusionary of us and our experiences. You have to listen to us. You have to be heard. You have to check your privilege, right? And so uh, I wanted to hear what some of the other big takeaways from you, uh, for you, you had from the book. Like, what were some of the other significant things that jumped out, number one? And number two, who do you think is the ideal audience for this book? because so much of the attention is paid to telling mainstream feminists and mainstream feminist organizations what they should be doing. Uh, who else do you think can benefit from reading this? I mean, I know I definitely benefited from reading this book. I think something that was interesting <laughs> is I've always subscribed to the idea that if it's not an everyone problem, we have a bigger problem. If my issue was not your issue, even if it doesn't affect you, then there's a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it was kind of, as Sid was saying earlier, like feminism was like my, I had my own definition of what feminism was. And I think now, cause I showed up at the women's march. I showed up at BLM marches. I, I always show up for, I mean, I try to show up for everyone. Um, so I think reading this book made me realize that I guess black feminism and feminism aren't the same thing for hmm. other people. Um, and they haven't been and the actual like history and root of mainstream white feminism was exactly that white and that it wasn't originally intended for us so it kind of sparked this like interest in knowing more about feminism if i'm going to claim to be a feminist and what that exactly mm -hmm. means and also very clearly defining what that is for myself in terms of defining what that is for ourselves and like what our respective versions of, I think it was Sid who said everybody has a version of, of what their thought practice looks like, right? So we could all be of the same religion, we could all subscribe to any number of the same uh, practices or beliefs, but the way that we, uh, the way it comes together for us is still going to be based on our individual um, experiences and our thoughts and, and, you know, what we prioritize most. I'd be curious to hear from all of you all, and I'd like to start with Logan, uh, if that's okay. 
what sort of things do you all believe need to happen to improve outcomes for Black women and girls? Like if we're talking about gender equality, if we're talking about a world in which we are given the space that we deserve, the acknowledgement that we deserve, that we're not, you know, needing to step up when a Black woman or girl has been sexually assaulted or murdered and, and begging and pleading for attention for her case, because if she were blonde and white and or wealthy, um, people would have noticed and it would have been all over the news. It, it, if we're not having to say we're getting paid 72 cents on the hour um, that, that white men are making and we have to work this many more days uh, to earn the same thing that you earned in a year. For us to get to that point, for us to get folks thinking about being at that point, what are some of the things that you all think that we need to do as Black women? Yeah, I'm glad you gave me the easy one. Um, I, Super easy. Uh, Thank you. Logan, can you fix the world real quick? You said you want to be a director, so. Yeah, no, yeah it's, it's just, it goes just like this. Um, so I think that, but yeah, I think that one of the things that we all can do is look at, make sure that we are standing on the shoulders that came before us, right? Like we're, none of us luckily are walking into this movement, not having uh, people who have fought for our lives before, when our lives were actually even more endangered. So I think it's, um, it's important to remember to look back at what's already been done, what worked, what didn't work. Um, I think that starting, I, I really think education on, a, on an entire kind of um, spectrum, not just, uh, well, for us, like teaching us about ourselves, teaching us about our histories, but also teaching people who, uh, who are white in this world about our history, about their history. Um, you know, I saw something that said if a, a black kid is young enough to experience racism, a white, a white kid is young enough to learn about it. So mm -hmm. I think that um, when you intersect those with uh, gender politics, I feel like, I feel, I feel like we, we, we have to, we have to dissect what has happened before. What I like that Mickey does in this book is she does not hold back from um, examining, exa examining different people, different white women in particular, who have um, made maybe mistakes in their um, approaches in their feminism and, and examining why, why this didn't work, why the apology isn't good enough. And I feel like that's important. I, I've learned even in my own life because I mean, it's, an, it, it's important in my relationships. If I have relationships with white people, I need to know or white women, especially, I need to know, you know, are you really supporting me? If you're not, then I need to distance myself. And we need to be okay to talk about that. We need to be okay to talk about if you are a white person in my life and you are either a covert racist or you are a white woman who's not supporting me as a black woman, this, this isn't good for me. This is, not, this is not good for my health, whether it's in the media, whether it's in a personal relationship. And I feel like we are not really comfortable talking about, we're all like, well, we just want everyone to get along and we do. But I feel like in the interim, if someone is keeping you unsafe with their thought practices, with the things that they're saying, we need to be okay distancing ourselves from them. And I also, I randomly saw this um, thing today, a young girl, a young black girl posted about the tropes of um, images of black women in the media. And, you know, of course it starts at the mammy and it goes into um, the, the, you know, you got the black exploitation, you got the sassy black woman, and then you go um, all the way into, um, you got the Oprah's and the Obama's, like the strong black woman. And then you go into today, we've got the awkward black girl. And I went, oh my God, no, I thought we made it. Like, I thought this was it. Mm. And I went, oh wow, we're just at another version of this thing, but we've never been like released from ourselves. Like we're all trapped inside of the lens of whiteness, inside of the lens of the white patriarchy. And I feel like, um, I think I'm talking around, but I think that we, we have to look back in order to go forward. And, um, and I think that putting the people who are at the bottom at the, at, in the leadership positions is the way to go. So in my opinion, Malcolm X says, the most disrespected, unprotected woman in America and the world is the black woman. I would say the black trans woman. I say put black trans women at the 
front lines. Let them lead the movement because they will make sure that they're protected. The other thing I loved about this book is her talking about hunger. I've always cared so much about how people hungry in the world, but never mm -hmm. thought about the intersections with feminism. There it is. It's, it's mm -hmm. our womanism. It's our black African womanism. It's right there. We don't have, these don't have to be separate things. I want to read from the book, um, particularly from chapter four, Fast Tailed Girls and Feminism. Um, and Fast Tailed Girls was a hashtag that Mickey and another writer, uh, Jamie Golden, created some years ago that talked about uh, the ways that Black girls are, the, the way that the sexuality of Black girls is policed and violated in so many ways, right? And so one of the most common refrains um, during the times that R. Kelly's crimes against black girls uh, made news was, oh, they were fast, those fast ass girls. They, what were they doing at the club? What were they doing hanging out with a man in his 20s, 30s, 40s, now 50s? Um, surely, you know, they knew what they were doing. What about the parents? What about these fast ass girls? And I'm sure that's a phrase that many of you all have heard in some way, shape or form, uh, because maybe because you wore something short or tight, or because a boy at school liked you, uh, or something that you may have heard older women in your family say to refer to other girls. Um, when you talk about those stereotypes, Logan, right? Those, Im those uh, images of us, the, the Mammy and the Jezebel that are used to flatten us and to make us less than human. The idea of black women being unrapeable has been central to our oppression, right? Since chattel slavery. So if we're not people, if we're not real women, if we're not human beings, then stepping into somebody's quarters at night and forcing them, um, forcing yourself on them is not a crime, right? If they're not a person. Uh, and, and even white women who were considered people did not have the same rights and freedoms over their bodies that men had. And so with us being less than them, we have no rights, no freedoms whatsoever. And how that same belief has been carried on into our own communities. So as opposed to us looking at a young girl who's been violated by a man sexually and saying, this is somebody who should have been protected. This is somebody who, you know, is a child who is vulnerable, even if she was willing, quote unquote, even if she said, yes, she's a kid. Um, instead too often they're met with, well, she was out here being a fast little girl. She was being a fast tail girl, that's what she gets. So Mickey writes, um, we were taught to fear the impact of rejection by whiteness to embrace their standards without giving much thought to the impact on our own well-being or that of our communities. So that if white, in other words, if white people don't approve of us, right? And that could be a teacher, that could be a social worker, that could be a neighbor, that could be a boss, um, that could be peers. If the white folks in our world don't think that we're good enough, that we speak well, that we look well put together, um, then something is, is wrong. And we have to be more focused on that. So that for many of us, um, you know, particularly in generations past, there was straightening one's hair. That was how, you know, not because that's the style you prefer, but because it's the style that you deemed acceptable. It's not wearing clothes that are particularly bright or that show off your figure. Um, it, it's looking like, looking or presenting in a way that's gonna make white people comfortable, right? And that being important to both our survival and perhaps at best our ability to thrive. We have to break down this conditioning. We have to ask why we're more concerned with how we are received by white supremacist patriarchy than we, am with, than we are with protecting ourselves. The alignment with middle-class respectability politics is therefore uh, opposed to personal well-being. So because we've been focused on respectability and creating a version of Blackness that white folks feel okay with, um, she argues that we haven't really been taking care of ourselves. We haven't actually been focused on our self-care. So with that said, um, what are some of the ways that you think we as a people and Black women in particular can break up with these notions that, that live inside of our heads because of white folks? How can we free ourselves to be the best versions of who we are naturally, as opposed to trying to act like what we think the oppressor wants us to be? Uh, well, I think, I think first and foremost, we have to kind of stick together because otherwise we'll just feel alone in it. Um, and also I think, you know, we just need more black women or women of color in power positions who can offer opportunities to other younger women of color, black women who, you know, uh, found, found their self-love and 
you know, found a way to be a a decent human being just like the rest of us without having to subscribe to these respectability politics, you know, to a T. And and um that that was a uh, one of my favorite parts of the book. Um because I know a lot about that. You know, I grew up in like a big house and in a in a very nice neighborhood and my mom was very on me about my grammar and like no ebonics and like mm-hmm. You know, it, it, there was a lot of uh, undercover, I don't know, acceptance seeking in uh, my upbringing. And it was in my mom's upbringing as well. So I understand why she passed that on to me. She she named me Sydney and my brother Travis so that on job applications, mm. you can't tell our race. Um, so yeah, that part that part of the book spoke to me the most specifically, but I think it's going to be about us changing the narrative and then us finding our power, finding positions of power, lifting ourselves up, lifting each other up so that we can kind of change the narrative from where we have the ability to do so. I got you, Sid. I look like a straight up white man on paper. Okay. (laughs) Yep, exactly. you do have a good white man name. Logan Browning <laughs> is always going to get a call back for an apartment for a job <laughs> interview. Um, in chapter six, Mickey talks about uh, the ways that white feminist women, um, journalists, and and scout- scholars, as well as uh, bloggers, have written about Black women, right? And and how difficult how poorly so many people outside of our community and particularly outside of those who have a pro-black woman um stance who who are intimately familiar with and share community with black women how so few other folks who who don't have those experiences how poorly they write about us right how they talk about um they cite statistics right without any context they can only point to std infection rates or low marriage rates um but they don't know much else about what it means to be a black woman and even if they do have a picture in front of them that looks bad or or challenging because it's just the statistics uh show and by every measure of quality of life in this country that black women and girls are suffering right and that we have a lot of challenges to our health to our mental and physical health to our ability to get an education employment housing etc with all of you all being artists working in media, I know you all certainly have some experiences with um, folks who don't know how to write about you, your work, right? Your your films or shows or your music, um, the way you look too, but they've been assigned a story about you, right? They're supposed to be talking specifically about you and something you've created, but because they don't know anything about Black women, that story falls flat or it's offensive, right? There's either something that's missing or there's things that they've decided for you, um, that they've assigned to your identity. They've decided that you're an activist because you're black, right? Or because you're queer, because you're a woman, right? Like they've decided that you're political from the get go or they don't want you to be political, but whatever it is, they've decided for you who you're gonna be. Um, What are some of the ways in which you all uh, in your respective, careers have had to challenge, I should say, falsehoods about Black women, uh, particularly in things that have been written about you or your work? I mean, I think being an R&B singer, people are very quick to expect me to talk a certain way, expect me to act a certain way, Mm -hmm. um, and be in a box. And um, R&B culture is a lot about emotion, but also about the culture, about being black, about being yourself. Um, And so when I would go into radio interviews, for instance, and they would ask me to do like the liners, they'd be like, all right, now go ahead and say, what's up? This is Kiana, blah, blah, blah. And like, they would even have it written, like, what's up? This is Kiana, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't talk like that. Like, What's that? you want me to talk how you want me to talk, but that's not how I talk. So I'm not going to say, what's up? I'm going to say, hey, or what's up? Did they up? write it? What is, did they actually have a Z? With Z's, with Z's. And I've been through that multiple times. And I'm like, oh. and they'll say stuff like, 
Now say it like you're at a party. I remember there was one scene in Atlanta where they made the guy, I don't remember what his name was in the show, but they made him say like, now act like you're at a party and it's like really crazy. I mean, that's, that's literally what they make you do. So um, I've been there. Like, multiple, sure. like you, you have too. Yeah, I'm sure. Like mm-hmm. I've gotten a lot like, okay, now sound more black or sound more urban, which is one of the reasons why I'm so like happy that that word is like being done away with because it really just means segregation. But yeah, that's probably like one of the, one of the things that I encounter the most being in my space that I'm in. What about you, Storm? most of the conversation that have that has been centered around me that could looked at could be looked at as negative um is me either being a young girl who is black or me being a young girl who is not black enough Mm. um specifically like when i got meg and a wrinkle in time meg was not written for a girl that looked like any of us um she was written as a white caucasian girl but miss ava she said that she wanted these young girls to see a young black girl to save the world and and then that's when the conversation started of like okay well that, that's not how we see her that's not how we've grown up and and, and fought like fallen in love with meg's character we don't see her that way so why does it have to be that way or i it's not even i, I know the question was kind of pertaining to female or, or, or journalist um but I, I like i'll go on twitter like i don't check my twitter but i'll go on twitter and i'll like see full-on conversations or arguments about how i am viewed as a token black girl because of the color mm-hmm. of my skin or like the, the melanin that i have and um i mean it's like something that i've tried to combat like i try to combat the ignorance at all cost, um, because even though I might, like not all black people look the same and that's what I try to reiterate. Um, but I mean, I, I feel like it, it, it's just me trying to take up space and me be undeniably unapologetically myself and have that unbridled joy of like, this is who I am and you either accept it or not. Whether you say these certain things about me or not, hopefully you're, you're trying to write about me in, in, in a certain light, in the right light, but also like, who am I? Like, what, what, what can I do in a way? other than try to uplift myself and, and have a, a support network of, of young black women or having conversations like this where, where people are uplifting me so I don't fall into the, the, the negative stereotypes or the stereotypes that are perpetuated against me specifically. Um, so that's been a little bit of my experience. Said, I'd be curious to hear from you. Um, I can only imagine some of the poorly constructed, inappropriate, uh, tone deaf questions that you have come across throughout your career uh, in talking to journalists. Um, as a Black woman who's, who represents um, a set of experiences that have not been appropriately or adequately or fairly censored in our culture in a number of ways, right? In, in terms of musicians, in terms of just how we think about Black women and how we speak about Black women and which Black women we um, deem worthy of being our representatives. Can you talk about what it's like to, whether you want it to or not, um, become a figure that represents a lot of other Black women uh, in public? I was raised to always be aware that I'm always representing Black women whether I'm, whether people know who I am or not, um, <laughs> that I'm always representing Black women as a whole and that because for that, I, it's, it goes back to the respectability politics, um, but I've always felt uh, a need to represent my race well, especially being a woman. As far as, as, far as uh, representing it in, in my career now um i'm i i do it i do it proudly it's it's not i i never really uh was irritated by the responsibility or any anything like that i know in the beginning when it came to my sexuality i tried to 
I tried to treat it like it wasn't a thing <laughs> because mm -hmm. to, to in my lifestyle, it wasn't, you know, it was just my preference. Um, and at some point I realized, uh, at some point I got stronger and I realized the need to kind of uh, represent that as well, in a sense, more, more, you know, I didn't grow up with any gay women around me, um, right. or very many. So I didn't grow up feeling like, okay, you're representing gay women. <laughs> and right. I grew up representing black women. And then, and then it was like, oh, damn, I'm representing gay, gay women too. Okay. Uh, let me figure this out. And it was a learning process for sure. Um, and I've, I've definitely, I've definitely had some issues with how I've been portrayed by um, white female editors and, and whatnot. Um, it's interesting. It's definitely, it's definitely a different lens. <laughs> what do you think that lens gets wrong about your experiences or your identity? Uh, I think, I think for one, I think they don't understand how, how we want to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and, I, and I don't, you know, it's ignorance and, and ignorance is a choice in itself as well. So like we can say it's their fault, um, but yeah, I just don't think they understand how, how, uh, how we wanna be seen. They don't have as much experience also writing about uh, black lesbians <laughs> or black women in general, because again, we don't get the same press um so i think it's a yeah i think it's a combination of uh lack of experience and lack of understanding you know and we don't have those conversations with them you know right and so i think that you know much of what mickey attempts to do with the book is to have that conversation right to say like you know those of you all who who want to be feminists you're not seeing us you don't read us you don't know us you don't know our lives and if you're going to speak for the women of you know this country you, you have to speak for us too and this is what that looks like right and yeah. so when you talk about represent or when we talk about representation and being seen i think that in the same way that white feminists particularly you know class mobile femin um they're oftentimes very divorced from the lives of even poor white women right women who look like them women who could even be members of their family let alone poor black women uh, and, and just, excuse me, they are largely uh, distant from the lives of Black women in general. But even among those of us Black women who, whether you identify as a feminist or you identify as a womanist, or if you're just someone who says, I believe that all of us, you know, are equal and we deserve things. Maybe I don't have one of those titles. Maybe I don't want to call myself an activist or something like that. Um, that even among us, uh, there's we're not always seeing, there are a lot of spaces in which we're, there are only black women present, but we're not able to see fit, right? There are only black women present, but we're not able to see black trans women. Uh, there are only black women present, but all the black women that are called to the room are of the same complexion and have the same kind of hair or represent the sort of looks that we see over and over again in media. We have been tr trained by a white supremacist patriarchy to prioritize those that are white this pet male uh, and, and class mobile above everything. And so the closer you are to that, the better. Everyone else falls somewhere else. It is our own women um, that, that are hurting so badly because we don't want to, because we're only comfortable with certain images of black womanhood, right? Because we only know how to praise certain types of black beauty, or we only know how to be comfortable with feminine presenting black women as opposed to masculine black women. And we don't know what to do with black women that are neither feminine nor masculine. Um, so before we go into the questions from viewers, I'd really like to hear you all talk about, and I'd like for everybody to just say a little word on this, how we can be better allies to other black women. Fighting for gender equality, we've got to fight with white girls, we've got to fight with our own brothers, we've got to fight with you know the world around us. How do we show up for Black women and help Black women who have been marginalized to uh, to be better included in media and activist spaces, et cetera? One way that I personally choose to uplift my fellow Black sisters is by hiring them. I'm uh, my own 
black business, small owned black business. And um, yeah, I choose to hire black women. And also I think, um, this is something that I talk about with my friends within the industry that work like more on the label side or the agency side, um, uplifting those voices and really listening to each black woman's experience in the building um, and see what they're going through and also bringing attention. Like, I mean, for instance, even in, in this space, Logan was like, wait, I don't want to forget about Kiana. Like moments like that are what I love to see from our own community and from our own sisterhood. So just more. Storm. Yeah, I mean, I can cre uh, agree with Kiana, uh, just lifting each other up, but specifically with me being an actress, again, like I said, I am viewed as the token black girl for many people. Um, and I, I want to try to combat that. So that's either rejecting or not not rejecting but passing projects that are meant for a girl of darker skin and they want to put me in the role like I don't feel comfortable with that so no like you need to cast who this was written for um or just giving more young black girls opportunities and, and making sure that even if I'm, I'm I might not be in the position at that moment in time to to give them an opportunity, just reaching out and saying, yes, I support you. I see you. I hear you. If you need anything, you can DM me. Here's my number. Let's connect. And if you have a question, you have a problem, like I'm there for you. It's just like being there uplifting and, and also giving more black women positions of power. Cause like, how are we going to be able to like, how are we going to let the, the younger generation feel like they can succeed when they don't see themselves? So whether that is on the agent side, like Kiana said, lawyers, like there's so many things that go into the entertainment industry that people usually forget about. They just think like the, the artists and the actors and actresses, but there's so many people that, that make decisions that don't look like us. So making sure that I could be a part of any type of process to give a, a fellow black woman uh, opportunity. And just because I'm looking at time, and I know I want to get to as many of the uh, user, I'm sorry, viewer submitted questions as possible. And I apologize to anyone who we don't get to because we won't be able to get through all of them. Um, I just want to ask my our last question of Logan and Sid, and then we will go to the audience questions. Um, to go back to the text, this book is largely a, a, a demand. I won't say a plea, but it's a demand to mainstream white feminism that it is time to acknowledge uh, your mistreatment of black women, your, the ways in which you have um, created a movement that is largely based off the labor of black women, the intellectual labor of black feminists, while not including them in. Um, do you all think that in this moment in history with uh, the resurgence, I should say that the second wave of Black Lives Matter um, with the outcome of the 2016 election and everything that's happening right now, do you think this is the moment in which mainstream feminism finally can and will embrace Black women uh, and, and give us the seat at the table that we deserve and that arguably most of us have not demanded because we found other ways to fight for liberation that we've chosen to uh, figure out ways outside of feminism uh, as an institution to advocate for ourselves? Do you think that now is, is this the moment where things change? <laughs> I don't think, I don't think this is the moment I think we we see little moments throughout history and I think it's just going to continue to be a, a progressive thing um, I think it, it's beautiful now to have the power of social media and that we can literally if we want to decide what trends to an extent um, and and I think that's just another another step forward so I think, I think we've got more power than we've ever had. And I think every, every new day we have more power than we've ever had. So I think it's just about continuing to be conscious of that and yeah. Logan, I'm going to, uh, I'm actually gonna give you the first audience question. Uh, it's loosely connected to what I just asked and I think it's a really great one. And this is from Zoe Scruggs who asked, what do you think it'll take for black women to be at the forefront of people's minds? How will the world have to change in order to make it normal to consider the ways that oppression affects all marginalized people, not just black men or black women? I keep thinking about the label of feminism and I keep thinking about how 
feminism was created with the intent that this is a good thing, this, we are gonna protect women, obviously it's fallen short. Um, so, and then we talk, we're, we've mentioned women as uh, being a womanist, um, but the truth is if we continue to like choose these labels, then ultimately as time passes, we're gonna find out that that label falls short. That's why LGBT went from LGBT to literally like the entire alphabet because you find out that you fall short the moment you start to try to like label this. I mean, you look at our, um, our politics and you realize that I can say for myself, I don't feel like I fall in these two like spaces. So then where do I, where, where do I belong? I feel like the result then is to look at, um, look at the ideas and to be open to constantly evolving our ideas and and continuing conversations like this, using moments like this, because this is a special moment in time because we are all listening. We are having dialogues like this on platforms like this and we are um, forming, we're gonna all leave here having formed a, a even more specific concept and idea of what we think of ourselves and how we look at each other and who we wanna protect. For me personally, I, I often try to um, educate the people in the spaces that I'm in. I am a black woman, period. I do not represent all black women, period. And I think that that's important. I feel like that's something that Mickey does very well in this book mm -hmm. is, um, and I think that's what she is saying that feminist, feminism got wrong, is I am a woman, period but you do not represent all women. And if that is the case, then how do we continue to cultivate these ideas and these thought conversations um, to really include? So um, Melissa McSwain asks, how has white feminism caused harm for marginalized women? And what are some of the most urgent ways in which intersectional feminists who are white can show up for the movement now? I mean, I think I'm just gonna say again, what I said earlier, just making sure that if you are a feminist or you are a, you belong to that idea um, and that is what you believe then really truly understanding that there is equality on so many levels and we do have so much work to do and bringing like Logan was saying bringing attention to the people like black not only black women but also black trans women and bringing them up to the front and making sure that they're heard. It, what chapter uh, or part of the book resonated with you most? Why don't we just answer uh, I, would, that? I would have to say the the respectability politics probably probably yeah yeah just growing up and and being overly aware of and not being not not knowing why though I didn't realize mm. growing up that it was to be approved by white people I just it was for me it was to be approved by society mm -hmm. and then you get older and you realize society kind of meant white people um, or or better yet people in power who happen to be typically uh, white men so um, it, it was interesting and 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 the older I got the more I was able to kind of combat it in little ways like uh, my, my dad would uh my dad was a businessman in power at, at his company and could hire someone and you know like would make a joke about like somebody with a, a, a ghetto name and I'd be like all right you for real or what he's like, I'm just joking I'm just joking but like you have to kind of you kind of like like Logan was saying we kind of have to just check it at every every chance we get so that was the that was the part for me that resonated the most I know there are a number of examples that Mickey cites in the book, but one that just jumps out uh, top of my head is when Gail King sat across from R. Kelly and he starts acting crazy and he jumps up and she's very still and stoic and she's composed. And the assumption being that she's badass, she's unbothered, right? Like people didn't think this woman could have been afraid for her life. She could have been afraid, you know, that any number of things could have happened. But when we see a black woman, unless she says I'm scared, and even if she says I'm scared, we don't necessarily assume that we're fragile, right? That we can be frightened. Uh, so I'd love for you to talk about what that fetishization of fierceness and strong black womanhood and being that outspoken black girl who tells everybody what they feel and, and you know where they can go and how, um, how that's been used against us. 
I, if I put myself in, in Gail King's place, I probably would have felt, had fear in my heart. Um, I think our show does a really great job of using, um, there's so many black women in our show and they're, and our characters are all radically different. Um, uh, if I'm just to talk about my own, uh, I feel like, um, one of the things you get to see in our, in our series is you get to see how it uh, self implodes on a, on a character like Sam. You get to see how being the leader of a movement, not chosen, really put on her, how it, it um, bleeds into her life and how she's literally, literally gets her life threatened by these like online trolls. Um, I feel like our best way to combat that is, is that is, is, also how we're portrayed. I mean, there's, there, I think our show has so many versions of black women, so many versions of our trauma, so many versions of how we deal with our trauma. Um, and I feel like, I mean, obviously therapy is a, is a very recent, I dare say trendy conversation, but I, I only started going to therapy as of November of last year. And so it's really important for us to keep talking about it. It's really important for our media to, to shape us as, um, and like, I realize I don't want to be the awkward black girl anymore. Like, I, I mean, I am an awkward black girl, but like, I don't want that to be, that's, I don't want that to be another box. I just want to be whoever I am. Um, yeah, I think, the, I think media really is important in how, how we're shaping our, our narratives of each other. One more question, folks. Um, it's from, uh, pardon my pronunciation if I get this incorrectly, uh, Khadijat Saludin, who asked, as folks with an impact and audience, how will you all continue to not only spark the conversation or conversations like this, but to continue it? And do you all have any plans to create spaces that are dedicated to fighting for justice and equality? even if we are all going to create spaces, like it's really important to comment on the fact that grassroots organizers are like always the place to go. It's the one thing that I've learned in all of this, all of these conversations. I just wanna say that, that's it. Yeah, um, I 100% agree. I, I don't like thinking of myself as like a leader in any way. I'm just existing in a space and trying to do my best and learn and, um, spread the word and educate and educate myself and then spread that word um, and make sure that people are really drawing their attention back to Black Lives Matter and the organizers of Black Lives Matter and NAACP and all the people that I look to. Um, so I really just look at my like platform and what I'm doing as like a news outlet or like a news source and I just share what I think should be shared. What about you, Sid? Um, I I've always I've always been a big lead, uh, a big example based leader type. Um, I try to I try to support as many black businesses as I can, especially black black women owned businesses as I can. Um, like Kiana said, I hire as many black women as I <laughs> as I can, um, and I think that's. I think that and being the representation that we want to see is 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 the biggest thing we can do from where we're positioned. Um, so I, I I like to I would like to keep doing that, being the representation. If I don't, oh, I've never seen a movie like this with two, you know, da da da. Then I then let's make it. You know, I, I'm I'm trying to do that with my next couple of years, and, and I guess with the rest of my life. <laughs> or whatever. For the foreseeable future. Um, yeah. Right, so before we close out, uh, I, I want to, you know, be clear to acknowledge that as much as, for folks who haven't read Hood Feminism, as much as it is a call out to the spaces and individuals and institutions that have devalued Black women's feminism, who've erased us from feminism, not given us uh, entry into their movement as they see it, um, it's also a love letter to Black women and how we have advocated and fought for ourselves, whether we call ourselves feminist, womanist, or you know, just somebody who's trying to get out of bed every morning and, and make it to work and take care of our families, that, you know, that we have shown up, that we have been leaders, we have been organizers, we have uh, sustained communities, churches, schools, we have done so much um, without effectively being supported 
by others around us and without effectively being credited for the ways in which we um, have supported so many uh, people, places, and things. So before we get out of here, I would really love for you all to all say a word of gratitude to the Black women in your life. Um, they may be your mothers, grandmothers, aunties, big sisters, uh, the women in your community who taught you Black womanhood, who taught you how to show up for yourself, to take care of yourself. Um, yeah, just a, a, a closing note of, of thanks and gratitude and love for the Black women who've influenced you, many of whom may have been hood feminists themselves. Uh, and we can start with, let's start with Kiana, then Logan, and then Sid. I think I would just like to say thank you to the Black women that are in my life that I can turn to in moments of insecurity or anger or whatever emotion I'm feeling because I have learned that if I'm not being that fierce Black girl one day, if I'm being um, a little anxious or a little sad, that it doesn't make me any less of a Black woman. It doesn't make me any less um, of a strong person. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Logan? Uh, um, if you ever get to meet my mother, you are a lucky person. My mother is so amazing. And um, I think a blessing and a curse that I grew up in a house where, I wouldn't say a curse, a blessing and it ended up leading to me needing to reconcile with my light skin privilege. But I grew up in a house where there was just black art everywhere. Like the images in my house, all of the art, it was, it didn't, it didn't look like me, but I felt, but it was me. Do you see what I'm saying? Like it was, it was darker skin, black faces in my bedroom, in the hallway, in the bathroom, everywhere. That is just what I saw. And so I feel like my mother, did a really great job of making sure that I, and my mom, my mom actually, I relate to Mickey because she did want me to be, uh, oh, hi. <laughs> she, she, she did want me to be a lady. She tried really hard for me to be a lady. And I feel like my mom really just wanted the best for me. I feel like all moms really just want the best for their child and you do the best you can with what you have. And, and I think she did a kick-ass job. Um, my mom, was has always been uh fierce in in the sense of not taking no ish and uh <laughs> and she i've always <laughs> yeah, that's tight that's tight yes exactly that's that energy um yeah my mom always always set a great example and she always also, she always kept me surrounded by other black women who also set different examples, you know, like other examples of black women, um, whether it was her monthly uh, shoe parties where all her friends would come through and one of her friends would come through with a bunch of like shoes to sell and they would chill and drink wine or barbecues at the neighbor's house or, or raising us in a predominantly black neighborhood where we, we grew up around black, successful black people and black women um, who worked as well, you know, who weren't just at the house. My, you know, watching my mom get up and, and work growing up was empowering for me. So shout out to her. Shout out to the mom, shout out to all the women, uh, the, the feminists from the hood and beyond in our community. Shout out to Mickey Kendall for this uh, very important, beautiful uh, book and for your work. It gave us a whole lot to think about and a lot to talk about. And I wish we had more time. It went by so quickly. And like, we could have uh, done this for two hours, but I'm sure you all have a pretty steady schedule of Zooms to get to because we're just Zooming through the day uh, right about now. Thank you all so much, Logan, Kiana, Sid, Storm, uh, for participating in this conversation. Thank you to the viewers, uh, those of you who sent questions, those of you who've been watching. Uh, thank you to Fem It Forward and to everyone behind the scenes of the Revolutionary Reads uh, Book Club.